The relationship between Carl Stortz and Colorado State University is unique, to be sure. For one thing, it's existed for more than 25 years. In the 1990s, we supported the first mini veterinary endoscopy teaching center with Dr. Tweet. Dave Tweed was one of the first to do laparoscopy in dogs. Eric Monet has taken laparoscopy to a higher level, laparoscopy as well as thoracoscopy. And these are the top experts in the world, and they've been working here at Colorado State University for literally decades. Fast forward to the current state of the Translational Medicine Institute at CSU, and we've got 12 full HD towers. Two integrated operating rooms. The combination of the best instructors and the best quality equipment and a breadth of equipment that is necessary to make the uh, procedures easier is a benefit to the learners because the learning curve is shortened. If you're working with uh, equipment that's either substandard or incomplete, if you're working with instructors who perhaps don't have the level of experience that the instructors here do, um, you're not going to get to the level you want to get in practicing endoscopy or endoscopic surgery. Clearly, Colorado State University is the most advanced uh, veterinary endoscopy teaching center in the world. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to CE Elevated, a CSU Vet CE webinar series. I'm Dr. Ross Palmer, your host from Colorado State University. I'd like to thank you for joining us on behalf of CSU Vet CE here at the Translational Medicine Institute. We've named this webinar series CE Elevated, symbolic of our snowy Colorado terrain today, as well as our mission to provide you with an elevated CE experience in all that we do. We are sincerely thankful this evening for the support of Carl Storrs Veterinary Endoscopy, who has made this webinar episode possible. Tonight, we're joined by Drs. David Tweet and Dr. Eric Monet. Dr. Tweet is a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine. He is a professor emeritus at, Col at the College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences here at CSU, and he served in numerous leadership positions including the ACVIM and the Comparative Gastroenterology Society. Dr. Tweet has received numerous teaching and research awards, including the Distinguished Teacher Award and the WSAVA International Scientific Achievement Award, amongst many others. Uh, Dr. Eric Monet graduated from veterinary school in France and worked for four years in private practice in Paris before completing his small animal surgical residency here at Colorado State University in 1994 and his PhD in 1997. He's authored more than 100 scientific publications and dozens of textbook, textbook chapters, and he's the editor of the textbook Small Animal Soft Tissue Surgery. He is a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Surgeons as well as the European College of Veterinary Surgeons, and he's the founding president of both the Society for Veterinary Soft Tissue Surgery and the Veterinary Endoscopy Society and he's been a leader in the field of minimally invasive surgery for many years. Uh, tonight, Dave and Eric will each be sharing their vantages of the various benefits to the patient, the client, and to the practice for veterinary endoscopy and lap laparoscopy. And if during their presentations, as you saw in the video, if you find yourself wanting to learn more, uh, both Drs. Tweet and Monet will each be leading a number of hands-on training courses here at the CSU Translational Medicine Institute over the next few months. And you're invited to check those out at csuvetce.com. Additionally, we have the entire Endoscopy Talks webinar series, including the presentation that was entitled Marketing Rigid Endoscopy to Maximize Return on Investment by Dr. Brian Evans. That was an excellent uh, episode and that's available at Endoscopy Talks as well as at CSU 
betce.com. So without any further delay, I think I'll turn it over to these two experts. And I think that Dr. Tweet, you're gonna kick it off this evening. Is that correct? That's right. All right, take it away. Okay, well, um, the title I was given is The Benefits of Endoscopy, the Patient, the Client, and the um, Owner. And um, there are a number of reasons of why one would do endoscopy. And one of the major reasons for GI endoscopy is simply to evaluate the GI tract and to take biopsies. But also you can diagnose specific GI disorders through endoscopy. There are a number of procedures that can be done. And sometimes endoscopy provides the highest diagnostic accuracy of any test. But I think the thing that really stands out is that GI endoscopy is really minimally invasive and a safe procedure. There is a quick and rapid patient recovery. And this all equates to a happy patient and a happy owner. So um, why don't some veterinarians offer endoscopy to their clients? And I think maybe one reason is they're just unwilling to make the financial investment. And I think if you have an interest, uh, you will find that um, uh, endoscopy um, purchasing GI endoscopes will actually pay for themselves. I think another reason is that sometimes veterinarians buy just poor quality equipment and that equipment then sits in the closet. And what happens is it's a dust collector. And if you have good equipment, that makes a tremendous difference in your willingness to do endoscopy. I think another reason is that there's a lack of proper training. Um, it takes a lot of practice for GI endoscopy to get good. It has a really pretty steep learning curve, but with time you will uh, be able to accomplish everything that I can do with endoscopy. I think also there's a failure to understand all the capabilities of endoscopy. There are a lot of different things that one can do with the endoscope. And so those are some of the things that you would learn about in a laboratory. I think equipment makes all the difference. And that has to go with sporting equipment. Um, you know, if you have good skis, if you have good running shoes, a good bike, it just makes a difference in what you do. And I used to, I really enjoy um, a lot of outdoor things. One of the things I enjoy doing is biking, both mountain and road biking. And I had what I guess I would call just an average road bike. And I really enjoyed it a lot. But then I purchased a really nice all carbon fiber, really light uh, bike with uh, electronic shifting. And, you know, I found that I wanted to ride my bike all the time. I really enjoyed it. And, um, and certainly right after I purchased my bike, um, I was involved in um, a bike ride across Iowa, six day bike ride. It's called the Ragbri. It's a lot of fun to do. And I was looking forward to all those rolling hills of Iowa. It was just so much more fun going up those hills when you had really good equipment. And you know, that also equates to endoscopy. Good endoscopes do make all the difference. You'll use them a lot more. They will, over time, pay for themselves. And, you know, if you do um, maybe one endoscopy every two or three months, it's not going to pay for your, itself. But if you do enough, it will. And the thing is, is that you're going to find that you're going to be able to diagnose more things, and you're just going to have a lot of better um, user satisfaction. And you're going to find that endoscopy really becomes a lot of fun. So I have four reasons why one performs GI endoscopy. And first is there are some conditions that can only be diagnosed with endoscopy. And we'll talk about some of those. It's also a very minimally invasive way to diagnose GI mucosal disease. We don't open up our patients anymore and take surgical biopsies, if we can do it endoscopically. And endoscopy actually is probably the best way to remove esophageal and gastric foreign bodies from our patients. And there are some therapies that are best done uh, doing it through endoscopy. And so there are a lot of reasons why you would probably want to do endoscopy. 
Some things that can only be diagnosed with endoscopy, one is esophageal disease, <clears throat> where you can actually look at the esophagus and see this esophagitis shown in this video. Sometimes you can diagnose polyps as shown in this center picture here. Uh, Helicobacter, here's an ulcer in a cat. And uh, on biopsy of this ulcer, we found all these helicobacter factor organisms. Uh, sometimes um, there's gastric mucosal hypertrophy in front of the pylorus. And sometimes that's missed on ultrasound, uh, routine radiographs, but can easily be diagnosed uh, through endoscopy. So this is Joey, a one-year-old little male French bulldog that had two problems. One is six months of chronic intermittent regurgitation and or vomiting. This dog would have uh, vomiting regurgitation two to four times a day. This dog also had his brachycephalic respiratory complex. And we could hear this dog breathing, you know, down the hallway, four rooms away because his respiratory sounds were so loud. So this dog came in with a dual appointment to work up the respiratory problems and the regurgitation. And on evaluation of this dog, he did have the respiratory brachycephalic complex. He had stenotic nares. You can see here, he had a very elongated soft palate. And then he had um, evidence of uh, everted laryngeal saccules that you can see here, which is this redundant tissue sitting uh, right next to the vocal folds and that markedly decreased his whole airway um, opening. So we did surgery and we corrected all those. Then we tried to address his respiratory or his uh, GI signs. And we went down in his distal esophagus and in the distal esophagus, you can see some red streaks coming up the distal part of the esophagus. And that distal esophageal sphincter was wide open. And this is very, very characteristic of dogs that have reflux esophagitis. And uh, Joey was diagnosed as having reflux esophagitis. We see this very commonly in brachycephalic dogs where they have so much upper airway obstruction that it actually pulls gastric acid into their uh, distal esophagus. So, um, we uh, did our airway surgery. Actually, Eric did surgery on this dog. I also put this dog on omeprazole um, for three weeks and then tapered the dog off of the omeprazole. Um, and the outcome with this dog, all the clinical signs resolved. And we had uh, a happy owner. So um, there are some conditions that are best diagnosed with endoscopy, and that usually is GI mucosal disease. You're able to visualize the lumen and take mucosal biopsies. And our endoscopes are so good now, you can see the villi pulsating in this proximal duodenum of this dog. Where, uh, and these villi that pulsate, actually what they do is they increase the surface area for digestion of nutrients. And we can then go ahead and take uh, biopsies directed through our endoscope. We can get multiple biopsies. I usually take seven or eight from the intestine, seven or eight from the stomach, and we can get really nice histopath where we can make a diagnosis in these patients. So there are some of these conditions that are best diagnosed with endoscopy. This is little Bailey, um, four-year-old castrated male Yorkshire Terrier. And this dog presented to us for the chief complaint of abdominal distension was found to have ascites. Uh, on laboratory work, we found that this dog had a pan hypoproteinemia. The albumin was 1.3, the globulin was 1.5. And on um, our workup, uh, the only reason that we could explain the high or the low proteins was lost through the GI tract. We confirmed that with ultrasound where we could see um, the mucosa being very thickened and you could see actually spickling within the mucosa. It should be all black here. And so we knew that this dog had mucosal disease. So what we ended up doing is uh, doing endoscopy on Bailey 
and we diagnosed that this dog did have lymphangiectasia. Now this is the duodenum and you can see all these white areas that are raised and these are dilated villi full with lymph. And so this is uh, dilated lacteals full of lymph. And what happens is they lose all this lymph through these dilated lacteals into their GI tract and it results in uh, a protein losing enteropathy. This dog was treated on an ultra low fat diet and in low fat diets decrease lymphatic flow to the GI tract. And over a period of about a month, the proteins return back into normal and this dog is doing absolutely great and was diagnosed um, through endoscopy. And so we had a happy dog and a happy owner. Um, some of the procedures that are best performed with endoscopy um, would be esophageal and gastric foreign body removal, bones in the esophagus. This video on the right shows us using a rigid, what we call an over tube, a tube that goes down our endoscope inside to the bone foreign body. And then we have a rigid grasper that we can grab that bone pull it up to, the or up to that rigid tube and pull the bone out through the esophagus. This, I guess my claim to fame is I designed this uh, foreign body grasper, this long rigid forceps for taking out uh, large bone foreign bodies in the esophagus and in the stores catalog, they called it the tweed foreign body uh, forceps. But um, this is Amy, a four-year-old Springer Spaniel that had two weeks of vomiting, lethargy and drooling. Uh, was referred into us. We took abdominal radiographs. We could see that there was a radiopaque foreign body in the stomach. And we took this dog to uh, endoscopy. And this dog had ingested a stone in the stomach. And the best way to remove these smooth stones is through or using an endoscopic basket. You can't get a good grasp with your grasping forceps or a snare. And so what we do is we get this uh, stone within the basket. And then what we do is slowly close down that basket around the stone so it can be removed out um, of the stomach, out the esophagus, and out the patient. And so we were able to grab a hold of that stone. Um, this is not an edited video at all. This is how long it took to grab that um, uh, stone to pull it up to our endoscope and uh, pull it out of the esophagus. And so we use a lot of baskets for removing foreign bodies. We also have various graspers and snares that also can be used for foreign body removal. So we were able to easily remove this foreign body um, using endoscopy. Uh, we got the stone out and we had a very happy dog and a happy owner. We can also use endoscopy to perform various types of endoscopic procedures. We can put in um, uh, gastronomy feeding tubes. Uh, these are PEG tubes, percutaneous endoscopic place gastrostomy tubes um, done endoscopically. We can use snares to remove polyps. This is a duodenal polyp in a cat that we can snare and remove. And we can also use endoscopy for stricture uh, repair as well. And this is little Heidi, a male castrated Siamese cat. Yeah, it is Heidi, the male cat. The owner thought it was a female. But anyway, this cat comes in because the owner says the cat can't hold anything down. And it had been treated for an upper respiratory infection with doxycycline tablets three weeks earlier. And we know that doxycycline has been associated with causing esophageal stricture formation. And indeed on this contrast, we can see there's a stricture at the cervical uh, or thoracic inlet of the esophagus. And this cat had a three millimeter uh, stricture. And the way we treat these with endoscopy is we do balloon dilation. And so we have um, a series of balloons of various size that we pass down through our endoscope and put it in the stricture, dilate it up under pressure and tear open that stricture. One of the problems is we often get scarring from uh, opening up that stricture and we have to do multiple dilations. Um, one of the things that we do to try to prevent scarring is we actually inject around the stricture with doxycycline or with triamcinolone and to um, uh, reduce the inflammation. 
And here we are putting the balloon in that esophageal stricture. We blow it up under pressure. Um, we usually use multiple balloons of different, of increasing size to dilate that area of stricture formation. And in doing so, um, uh, we're able to usually get that lumen up to about the normal size of a normal esophagus. And you can see here, post dilation, we got a little mucosal tearing. You can see where some of that uh, transcinolone was that we injected, maybe a little tearing right here. But we were able to, after doing this, pass our scope easily down the esophagus of this particular uh, patient, Heidi. And we sent the cat home being fed a soft diet. And we got the cat back um, one week later uh, for a recheck. And the owner reported my cat is not vomiting at all. And on repeat endoscopy, the esophagus looked very normal. And so again, we had a happy cat and a happy owner. And so I think that, um, you know, you need to, a lot of people question, well, how do I learn GI endoscopy? And I think, yeah, you know, there are a lot of big court or big uh, meetings that give a half a day course on endoscopy. And that might give you just an, uh, a, a very brief introduction to decide, is this something that I really want to do? But you need to take a comprehensive endoscopy course. We give uh, two-day endoscopy courses where you have a lot of hands-on time doing endoscopy. But the other thing you need to do is you need to practice what you learn. And you need to always think, can I use endoscopy for this case? And that's the only way you're going to get better, is just practice and practice and practice. Now, there are some good textbooks out there that you can review, review um, as well. And then also, as Ross pointed out, we do have a series of 60 um, webinars on endoscopy, all types of endoscopy, GI endoscopy, laparoscopy, respiratory, urinary endoscopy, um, uh, laparoscopic assisted uh, procedures and so forth. Uh, this is one of the webinars I was involved with uh, entitled Endos Endoscopic GI Foreign Body Removal, 100 Years of Collective Experience. I could probably just rename that as three old guys talking about uh, removing GI foreign bodies. But, um, you know, if you practice a lot, you get good equipment, you learn all the indications, all the things you can do with endoscopy, I think you're going to have fun and you're going to be able to really help your patients and the owners. So with that, Ross, I'll answer any questions anybody may have. That's great, Dave. Um, as some, several questions came up. Um, one is you were describing a patient that had panhyperproteinemia, and would that panhyperproteinemia preclude a patient from undergoing anesthesia for endoscopy? Want to comment on that? Yeah, I don't think it would at all. Uh, they may be a little bit hypotensive with their proteins being uh, low. There may be some people that might temporarily give some plasma before anesthesia. Um, but we're doing such a minimally invasive procedure that I don't think it's a, a major contraindication of, of anesthetizing this dog. And probably you have much, you don't have to worry about healing uh, if you did a open, as you would with an open surgical procedure. You, um, you described a, a bunch of different unique indications. They were pretty cool cases um, uh, for GI endoscopy. You know, from your experience and maybe the experience when I mean, you talk to your colleagues and, and whatnot, are there maybe a top two or three indications in general practice where you think uh, if, if somebody were to learn endoscopy, what are maybe the top two or three skills they'd start with? Well, the top three would be, would be the first three that I talked about. You're probably, when you're first starting out, you're probably not going to deal with esophageal strictures. You're not going to remove polyps and maybe not even put in uh, endoscopic peg tube placement. That takes a little bit more skill. But other than the diagnostics for mucosal biopsies, certainly foreign body removal, um, you know, we all see foreign bodies in there. And um, so, and then, you know, just 
looking, you know, at the esophagus with animals with vomiting regurgitation, you know, I certainly think that's a big indication. If you uh, don't come up with a definitive diagnosis that endoscopy would be the next step. Yep, cool. You know, I I, uh, I always enjoy watching these because even even for an orthopedist, I mean, it's it's mechanical enough. I get it, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, like that that basket going around things is like a python around the uh, uh, around the rock. That was a very cool case. Um, so tomorrow, actually, we have a course where we're going to be training some young vets uh, in kind of their first exposure to GI endoscopy. Um, you know, what sorts of things are they going to be doing in that lab experience in their sort of day one? And, and what do you think will be their takeaways? Yeah, well, um, day one, um, you know, we, we did lecture to this group today and tomorrow they're going to endoscope uh, normal dogs. So they're going to learn how to handle the scope. They're going to learn how to get down through the esophagus. They're going to learn how to get into the stomach, identify the normal anatomy of the, uh, the stomach in a dog. And then they're going to find the pylorus. And probably the hardest part of endoscopy is getting through that pylorus into the duodenum. And so they're going to attempt that. And they're going to have a number of um, uh, uh, attempts to be able to do that. Uh, with this group, we're going to rotate stations. So they're going to be able to endoscope uh, three different dogs during that uh, period. So they may have some that might be a little bit easier. And then in the afternoon, we will have some cadaver dogs in which uh, we will spend time just removing um, gastric foreign and esophageal foreign bodies. So I've got two questions uh, that came in just recently about dilatations, esophageal dilatation. Um, so one is, what are your thoughts on ballooning via endoscopy versus placement of a BE tube for esophageal stricture? And then do you perform dilatations with a Savari Girard bougie? So maybe yeah. you can comment. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, I can. Uh, those are pretty technical questions. The BE tube, um, I don't do that as a first line. Those tubes cost, with all the equipment, cost you about two grand. And a lot of animals can be um, adequately treated with uh, just uh, uh, dilation. I'm of the school of balloon dilation, which radially dilates the stricture. There are some people that will do bougenage, which is using a rigid tapered um, instrumentation through the stricture and um, uh, dilate that way, I think you get a little bit more shearing force and maybe more problems associated with damage of the esophagus. But there are papers that report that that's equally as um, successful in um, uh, esophageal strictures. And this, um comment about do you use the Savari Girard bougie is that no, is don't. that uh, that that's okay. sort of there are different types of Maloney's okay. and the olives and so they're very different types of bougie okay well thanks Dave that is great information I'm going to now uh, introduce uh, Dr. Eric Monet and he's going to be talking to us about laparoscopy so Eric uh, take it away all right, so yes, we're going to talk about laparoscopy and um, again, talk about the benefits for the patient, the client, and the doctor here. So, I mean, over the last probably 15 years now, um, we've been trying to move away from laparotomy and move to some different forms of laparoscopy. Either you do it with multiple ports, single port, you're doing it assisted. Um, it's definitely a big trend where we're going, and it's it was going this way in the human side many years ago, and we finally um, getting in the same trend in the veterinary field. And I learned from Dr. Tweed how to do laparoscopy, watching him doing it in his own patients there. And um, with using only those very small incisions, we're going to be able to place a rigid endoscope into the abdominal cavity, go with instruments and do the procedures and visualize the structures that uh, we need to do surgery on. So that's uh, what's going on with um, laparoscopy here. And obviously when you do laparoscopy, you're going to need to 
get equipment. Like Dr. Tweet just mentioned, you need to get some good quality equipment, and I will add to it good quality equipment from a reliable source. And that's very important, okay? Uh, my best advice, when you're going to decide what equipment you want, don't go and buy on eBay, okay? Uh, stuff you're going to get on eBay is outdated very often. They don't work together. You're going to get extremely frustrated and you're going to quit very quickly. So good equipment, reliable equipment, reliable source. So then you'll have fun doing those procedures. And yes, it's a little bit of an investment. We'll talk about that again at the end. And, uh, but it's an investment that's really worth doing. And when we talk about laparoscopy, um, we talk about laparoscopic surgery, which means we're going to do the entire procedure uh, with laparoscopy. So we'll do all everything inside the abdominal cavity with very small incision with our cannulas. Versus there is another version that's called the laparoscopic assisted surgeries. And we're going to use laparoscopy to visualize the organ we want to work on, and then do a small opening over the abdominal cavity and finish the surgery as an open surgery, okay? And that's still extremely beneficial for the patient because we're going to minimize again soft tissue trauma that might make the surgery a little bit easier. And those laparoscopic assisted surgeries are good surgeries to start with uh, when you start to learn minimally invasive surgery. And so what are definitely the benefits of doing this? And it's a bit of the work of Dr. Tweed here, but uh, you're going to start by doing, for example, laparoscopic biopsies, okay? And that's a picture I got from Dr. Tweed a long time ago, but um, you can see this liver lobe with all those different nodules here and the benefits with laparoscopy, you're going to visualize the tissue you're going to uh, biopsy, okay? So you're going to target those nodules, different, no <clears throat> different nodules with your biopsy forceps. So you're going to be much more accurate and then several studies now have looked at the quality of the biopsy you're getting with laparoscopy. And they've shown that the biopsy you're getting and the laparoscopy are much better quality than the one you can get uh, guided through ultrasound, for example. Okay, so that's one of the very good things that you can do with laparoscopy is improve the quality of your diagnosis here, which will be extremely beneficial for your patient. Continuing on the trend of visualization is the nice, huge benefits of laparoscopy in my equipment, in my um, uh, ideas is that being a surgeon is the amount of visualization we get because we get so much light, so much magnification. See here the ureter? You never see a ureter that well with an open surgery or very difficult. Or if you want to see it that well, you have to make a big incision, okay? So that's one of the benefits of uh, minimally invasive surgeries is the quality of the visualization, the, v the view we have. It doesn't matter if it's a big fat uh, Labrador that you're going to spay, you're going to see as well as if it was a small dog, okay? And uh, so now you have way much less risk of damaging ureters, okay? You have much less risk of leaving an ovarian remnants there because you're going to see the ovary. So you're going to be clearly away from that ovary, clearly away from those ureters. So that's definitely one of the great benefits as a surgeon. And definitely since I've been doing minimally invasive surgery, I think we do a much better quality work. We're becoming better surgeons because we can appreciate even more the amount of soft tissue trauma we could create if we are a bit too aggressive with the tissue. Also, you know, when you do an ovariectomy, uh, sometimes it could bleed or sometimes it's hard to tell it's bleeding, not bleeding and what is going on. And you keep 10, 15 minutes watching your pedicles and not knowing what's going on. But again, like you could see on this video, what if it bleeds, you see it. Okay, that's no question. So you know right away, yes, it's bleeding. I can control it by cauterizing one more time the pedicle or putting a clip or putting a suture, whatever you like to do, but that makes it very obvious. Okay, so that takes that uh, out of the equation here. So again, better outcome from your surgery because you can see so much better what you can do, okay? 
And usually ovariectomy is a great procedure to start to do laparoscopy because it's a surgery you know how to do it open. So if you have any problem, it's an easy conversion. You know how to do that. You know the anatomy. Conversion will be very easy for you. So that's definitely the best technique to learn to uh, do laparoscopy uh, ovariectomies. And we teach that, that in a course here that's going to be extremely valuable for you. Another surgery that I like to do um, with laparoscopy now is cryptorchidectomy. I will probably never do another cryptorchid open because again, we're going to benefit from the visualization we have with the endoscope. So we're going to see those intra-abdominal testicle right away. We can also use it as a diagnostic tool. You know, sometimes you have those big fat dogs and you don't know if the testicle is sub-Q, not sub-Q, is it an inguinal ring? Is it uh, into the, the fat here along the, the pre -pews? And I've done it in a few dogs. Instead of starting digging and dissecting into the fat, I just put the, the five millimeter cannula, put the endoscope, look at the inguinal ring, figure out if the testicle is in a sub-Q or not. And again, you're going to visualize those testicles. They're going to be extremely obvious, okay? very straightforward, very easy to see. So again, it's going to facilitate the surgery tremendously, okay? And you're going to use different techniques to ligate the pampiniform, ligate the ductus, whatever you want to do. And again, it's going to improve the quality of the work. No more risk to do a prostatectomy. I mean, yes, we see prostatectomies done at least two or three times a year instead of doing cryptorchidectomies because people are trying to do it through a small incision, a small paramedian incision, and that's a terrible complication to get, and it's been published too. So now laparoscopy will avoid this problem, okay? But again, we'll make the surgery so much easier. Another great application is, for example, ovarian remnants. You know, ovarian remnants, usually we leave an ovarian remnants because we are doing the surgery on a big fat dog, so it's hard to get the whole ovary out. And then when you want to go back in this dog and find the ovary buried in the fat, well, here with um, the magnification and with the light and the improved visualization, it will make that surgery so much easier, okay? So you have different example here of ovarian remnants in dogs and cats and different animals. So, but it's very simple to see it. You don't have to wait for the dog to be in a heat cycle, okay? So you're going to visualize those ovarian remnants extremely uh, easily and uh, very simple way. And then you can do the resection of the ovarian remnants like you could do an ovariectomy anyway. If you prefer to do an ovarioestrectomy, that's fine. You can do ovarioestrectomy through laparoscopy and you can do them laparoscopically assisted. And again, it's going to improve the quality of your work. Okay, you're going to change a little bit your technique, but you're going to remove completely the uterus and completely the ovaries. Okay, because when you try to do supposedly an ovaryoestrectomy, so a small incision just caudal to the umbilicus, and everybody's trying to do it through a small incision, you're going to take a big risk to leave a piece of ovarian remnants, and you're going to have a long piece of uterus left in place. And that's the best recipe to get a pyomisra, okay? So here, when we do it laparoscopically assisted, we're going to remove both ovaries, like you've seen the ovariectomy, so we know for sure. And then since we do it laparoscopically assisted, we're going to do our, uh, place our second cannula right over the cervix. So then we'll be able to remove completely the uterus. We're going to ligate the uh, body of the uterus right over the cervix. So the whole uterus is removed. So there is no risk of having a stump pyomisra after that, okay? So that's another great benefits of that surgery. Again, you improve the quality of your work dramatically. Another procedure that is very beneficial also with laparoscopy, which is laparoscopically assisted is removal of bladder stones. I do almost all the bladder stones I see now with, with laparoscopic assisted procedure. You can see here, like you could see in this video, how those bladder stones are removed, just kind of like with a vacuum effect with the cannula into the bladder. 
So all the stones are vacuumed out pretty much with the flow of saline. And then you can remove the bigger stones with the grasping forceps and pull them out of the bladder. But the nice thing here is, you know, again, you don't leave a stone in a bladder. You can follow your catheters into the urethra and inspect the whole urethra in a female dog. Obviously, in a male dog, you're not going to visualize the entire urethra because it turns at the level of the ischium. But again, you're going to create a great visualization of the bladder, great visualization of the urethra, making sure you don't have stones left in there. Okay, so that's again better quality of work for your, for your patient here. Other procedures that is very, very um, beneficial is to do laparoscopic assisted gastropexy. You know, preventive gastropexy is becoming extremely popular. It's a great way to avoid uh, having um, dogs with a gastric dilatation valvulus. They can still dilate, obviously, but they cannot have a valvulus, which is a dangerous part. And again, here, laparoscopic assisted procedure made a huge improvement in this technique. We were offering this many years ago before we could do it laparoscopically assisted. And pretty much nobody wanted to do that surgery with a big incision like you can see at the bottom of the screen. So definitely minimally invasive surgeries reduce the amount of soft tissue trauma, no matter what procedure you're going to do. So again, that's a great technique to learn. We offer a great course to do laparoscopic assisted gastropexy here on rescue dogs that are going to be adopted afterwards. So that's the real experience here. And you can create those very nice incisional gastropexy through a very small incision. You can see here the size of the incision compared to the size of the instruments. It's probably three to four centimeter long. Okay, So very, very good for those dogs. Very nice recovery after you do a good line block at the spot of the, at the surgical side, those dogs are doing extremely well postoperatively. Also, much less aftercare, okay? Much less trauma, much less pain, much less risk of having a day sense. And that's where a great application on exotics animal, okay? I was lucky many years ago to be involved in a project um, to do ovariectomies on lionesses, and it was perfect because we could do those surgeries, release them, okay, in their uh, environment without having to care about uh, risk of infection, risk of descent, and all of this. So that's a great technique to reduce the care afterwards. And we published a study a few years ago where we looked at 160 laparoscopic ovariectomy performed by senior vet students. And they, be, they were senior vet students with very, very limited experience. We only had 17 minor complications in those dogs. And they were very minor, nothing big, nothing to put those patients at risk for anything. We have no bleeding, no infection, no hernia, no dace. And so shows you that it's a pretty nice technique to learn. Obviously, there is a learning curve and that you learn those techniques taking different courses. And like I said, those animals have a much better recovery, okay, much less aftercare, which is what the owners wants to see also. Those animals are much less painful. Tons of studies have been done looking at pain scale, glucose level, cortisol level, activity level, and all those studies show those uh, animals are much, much less painful after surgery with a much better recovery. And also the other great benefits of that surgery for, for us, the, the surgeons, the doctors, the general practitioners is the visualization we get, magnification, light. And that will reduce the risk of hyatrogenic trauma to other organs. Like I already mentioned, ureters, having problems doing cryptorchidectomies, all those problems are going to uh, go away while you're doing laparoscopy. When was the last time you saw an ovary that well? As you can see in this picture here, okay, when was the last time you could see it that well with an open surgery in the big fat Labrador? It's probably never, all right? And also, um, the big nice thing about laparoscopy, since we get such a good visualization, not only we're going to reduce the risk of iatrogenic trauma, but also much less risk of hemorrhage. Or if there is bleeding, we're going to see it extremely well, okay? So that's going to be another uh, big benefits of that technique. So 
quality of the work. Okay, that's what I'm looking at when I'm doing uh, laparoscopic uh, procedures. Okay, and it depends what surgery you're going to do, but you're going to have way much less risk also of having infections, much less risk of having uh, the essence. Okay, and definitely in practice, you're going to be able to do ovariectomies, gastropexies, cryptorchid surgeries, cystotomies, all those different procedures that can be done in dogs and cats. And there is a great study that we've done a few years ago where it looks at the economical impact of laparoscopy in a private practice. And we looked at these private practitioners that bought the equipment, took different courses to learn. So we look at all the expenses and then we look at the revenue we could generate from uh, doing basic laparoscopy like ovariectomies, gastropexies, and then you expand it to some other procedures. But you can see the total revenue overwhelmingly above the cost of the equipment and the training he had. So he pretty much paid for it within a year to two years of doing the uh, learning, doing laparoscopy. So definitely in conclusion, I mean, the great benefits for the patient, okay, you're going to do much better work, much less pain, much less complications. Owners are going to be extremely happy with this because they don't have to worry as much about risk of herniation, risk of seromas, and all those problems. And you, as the practitioners, again, you're going to improve the quality of your work, and it's going to have a very nice economical impact on your practice. That's all I have. Well, great information, Eric. Um, there was a question that came in, said that when you were talking about the laparoscopic assisted cystopexy, how do you keep the bladder from collapsing while you're vacuuming the small stones? Yeah, I mean, it's a great, great question. I mean, it's a whole balance that you need to establish in between the in, inflow of saline and the vacuum that you're producing. So you constantly have to adjust that. You learn that very quickly. If you over vacuum, you collapse the bladder. If you over increase too much the flow, you're going to overstretch the bladder and create bleeding. So it's a fine skill that you need to learn, but you're going to learn that very quickly. And it's extremely efficient way to remove small stones. I mean, you cannot do big stones, obviously, but small stones are going to come out very quickly. There's also a great uh, discussion of the crypt orchid and, you know, where's the, where's the missing testicle? And you mentioned looking for the testicle in the inguinal ring. So is that done from the abdominal side. So that's your laparoscopic view up into the inguinal ring. And at least yeah. it resolves that mystery. Uh, tell us yeah, about I that. I mean, we've used it not long time ago. We had a case where we could not decide where that second testicle was located. So we just put a cannula into the abdomen, look at the inguinal ring. And if you see the ductus deferens going through the ring, you know the testicle is going to be in the subcutaneous area. If you don't see any structures going through the ring, you know it's in the abdomen. And usually intra-abdominal testicles are so obvious anyway. Yep. Um, I have to thank you guys. Um, you know, Brian Evans uh, did one of those endoscopy talks episodes. He's a general practicing vet. And he did one entitled Marketing Rigid Endoscopy to Maintain or, or to Maximize Return on Investment. Um, and I found myself as I was listening to both of your presentations, just thinking about utilizing these minimally invasive techniques really through the lifespan of a patient. So beginning with a, a, a client with a puppy, right? And so they're looking for minimally invasive solutions for sterilization. And so you here you have the opportunity uh, to use it for an ovarectomy. Um, you know, a year of age, the dog chews a foreign body and you need to retrieve it. Now you're using the GI endoscopy. Uh, later, maybe in life, you're using it to, uh, to do a laparoscopic biopsy of something. Um, but I, I just found it uh, interesting to think of how you can, you can begin to sort of uh, strengthen that bond to your client starting at puppyhood and, and really just demonstrating benefits through life. Really interesting stuff. Well, if you get comfortable with the equipment, you can do so much with it. Yeah used to it and you like Dr. Tweed said why don't we try it and yeah he's always been Dr. Tweed always been pushing me when he was in, uh, here I mean it's just say why, why why don't you try this with laparoscopy and when you get comfortable with it you're going to try so many different things 
Yeah. yeah. I, might, I just might make one comment, and that is that nowadays it seems like clients know about minimally invasive surgical procedures and endoscopy because they've had it or their aunt had it or whatever, and they want it for their animals now. And so they actually are coming in and we have clients requesting, can you do this with laparoscopy or can you just put a scope down and do it? And so, um, you know, I, I, this is, you know, it's now- it's becoming high demand. Yeah. yeah, high demand. And I think what's cool is you guys have both identified very practical techniques that, you know, in a primary care practice setting, uh, boy, you're right there on the front lines and you've got the tool to to do so much of it. That was that was really interesting stuff. So hopefully our audience found that uh, uh, intriguing and interesting for them in their own practices. Um, anything that you would like to add before we close out this evening, guys? No, I mean, you'll go through, through a serious learning curve, but very, very quickly, you're going to improve. When I learned to do laparoscopy from Dr. Tweed, then I call the Humane Society and I say, hey, I'll spay 10 of your dog for free. And after you do four or five, you get really good at it. But the first few one, you're going to struggle, that's for sure. Yep. Well, I, I have to say, uh, for me, being the fly on the wall and watching these training courses, you know, here I'm, here I'm the arthroscopist, and so I'm watching the, the things that you guys do, and it is amazing. And and there is, for sure, there's a learning curve, but it's amazing um, how when they progress through the training, how relatively short that learning curve can be. And, and, uh, and then lots of times just that, that kind of exposing a particular challenge. And then one of you walks up and shows them a, a kind of a quick trick. And all of a sudden it's like, check that box. I've, I've learned a new skill. So pretty cool stuff. Well, I appreciate you both uh, uh, with your presentations this evening um, and your willingness to contribute to the CE Elevated webinar series. I also want to thank our sponsor this evening, Carl Storrs Veterinary Endoscopy, for sponsoring this episode. As a reminder to everybody who is out there, um, these two guys, Drs. Tweet and Monet, are each leading a number of hands-on training courses really in the next few months here at the Translational Medicine Institute at Colorado State University. And so you can sure check those out at csuvetce.com. I would like to thank all of you for joining us this evening. Next month, we'll be learning about the treatment options for cranial cruciate ligament disease. Was Goldilocks ahead of her time? That episode will be presented by Dr. Don Hulse from Texas A&M University on Wednesday, March 2nd at 7 p.m. New York time. That's 5 p.m. here in the mountains. And we look forward to seeing you then. In the meantime, remember, you're more than a learner. You're a whole person. Take care of yourself and let's look out for each other. Have a great evening, everybody.